Hey there, folks. Welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we got a solo album review. The newest project from Lingua Ignota, Sinner Get Ready. So, I imagine that nobody is surprised this is getting a solo review. Or, you know, maybe they are. Hell, the last time I reviewed Lingua Ignota proper, it wasn't a solo review either. It was shot from a hotel room in compilation while I was in London on vacation, and even then, I'd argue the album's true resonating power didn't really materialize for me until the last months of 2019 for... Let's say very personal reasons. And that shouldn't be surprising, because Caligula is a difficult album in every way. Beyond the fact that Kristen Hader is such a raw and visceral presence as a singer, the subject matter surrounding abuse from both a partner and oneself that can juxtapose the immediate and very human impact with the biblical scope of the emotionality in the production, tough to take in, even more difficult to revisit at least at first. But in the last months of 2019, the best way I can describe my experience with Caligula was on some level therapeutic. Without going into a lot of detail, the infusion of a distinctly Catholic aesthetic alongside its gut-churning rage tapped into something that gave me a space to really contextualize and experience and process some of those emotions. Now, that's not at all uncommon. Hell, I can argue, and I have argued, that a certain emotional relatability is the foundation of all our engagement with art. But when you get into experimental territory that's outside of the traditional boundaries of song structure and conventional delivery, or writing where a lot of the brutal directness is part of the point, it's kind of understandable if it can take some time to really resonate beyond sheer shock and awe. One reason this review is late especially if you don't have a lot of parallel experiences. It's one reason that it feels kind of distinctly weird and a little wrong to rate or rank albums in experimental spaces like this. Because while of course craftsmanship and execution is very important, providing a numerical grade to an experience where it either shocks but might not stick, or cuts way too close to be adequately contextualized, or to a certain irony dead audience that feels nothing and just cannot get enough of telling everybody that, just feels a little inadequate. To paraphrase Dan Olson's review of Doug Walker's The Wall, in my opinion, it's impossible to engage with certain stripes of transgressive experimental art, and Caligula specifically, without leaving a lot of yourself on the table. What you fixate on, what you might think is silly, or why. It's going to demand a level of emotional honesty to do the review right, which is the big reason I felt that I kind of had to split any Lingue Nota content here and going forward into a solo review. But it also got me thinking in a similar note to when I covered Jetty Bones earlier this year. I just can't expect or assume that Sinner Get Ready will have the same emotional or psychological gut punch that Caligula did at that time, especially a year and a half removed from the most visceral points of impact for me that came with therapy and the world-changing calamity around us. So even with the frankly insane amount of hype going in behind this, I was very cautious going into the album, especially knowing that there was also a change in sound along the way, and a shift in focus to look more at religion, specifically a more intense evangelical stripe across the context of the United States. And yeah, that does unfortunately tilt into American Catholicism as well, don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And that meant I was gearing myself up for a pretty complicated and difficult listen, especially given that experimental art like this is not guaranteed to resonate within the context of a conventional album or conventional album review. But I will say this, having given Sinner Get Ready plenty of listens, I think I'm in a unique position to talk about this album specifically. In previous reviews, and a couple extended memes, I've talked around my experiences with religion and faith in comparison with a general hard atheistic perspective that seems to be expected by the internet at large discussing art. And while all this is intensely personal, and in most cases very private, I do feel it needs to exist as some kind context for what I'm going to say about this album because I do think my experience is kind of unique and not really in alignment with what Lingua Ignota describes as her experiences with religion, which might be why this album strikes a bit of an odd note for me. Not a bad note by any stretch, I still think this is a pretty great project, but one I'm going to have to explain, so strap in, a lot of talking about me first. But okay, 
I was raised very Catholic. Altar server up until I graduated high school. My pastor was convinced I could go to the seminary. And I also attended a Catholic school that had its own pastor with a rather notorious reputation for being extremely hardline traditionalist and conservative. Now that pastor clashed very starkly with the one I had in my home parish. And you know, if there was one person who kept me in the faith longer than anyone else, it was that home parish priest. For one, he was intensely intellectually curious, and he believed in showcasing the Bible and Catholic doctrine with a very modern and historically comprehensive point of view. He taught that the creation stories and the book of Revelation, they were largely intended as metaphor in order to place them in context with real scientific fact that he adamantly supported, that the Bible was a historical text that evolved and changed through so many authors and revisions and translations that the church's history it's spotty and corrupted especially when it took on as many political aims as it often did and that priest would rail at length against fundamentalism and the literal interpretation of texts so when you have a priest who is as forward thinking and progressive as they come that my family deeply appreciated and has been a part of my life for decades opposite a cantankerous pastor who would quite literally recruit students to protest in front of abortion clinics and then make headlines about their debate teams refusing to acknowledge the possibility of gay marriage. This is the mid-2000s in Canada, just to date all of this. Yeah, there'd be some tension for me with religion growing up. And it got even more complicated by the fact I'm a total nerd. I listened to a lot of heavy metal. I played Dungeons and Dragons while we had textbooks calling both of them gateways into Satanism. I may have surreptitiously sabotaged some of those textbooks. But here's the funny thing. My parents actually got me the mature source books like the Book of Vile Darkness and the Book of Exalted Deeds. And while the graphic imagery often gets way more attention and controversy from both books. There's also some pretty extensive conversations about morality within games that varied wildly from what we taught in religion classes, had a much more secular and comprehensive point of view. And by the time I got to my senior year, I was researching paganism and Wicca and Satanism proper, and realized not only just how much the church had borrowed from paganism for millennia, but how they framed ethics and morality felt woefully inconsistent and incomplete. And bear with a pretty strong teenage anarchist streak at the time, despite me getting straight A's and winning Athlete of the Year multiple times, I was still getting called into the principal's office because of concerns of me hanging some controversial text in my locker. But then I graduated. And then I took philosophy courses in university alongside of my physics degree. I just wanted to take philosophy and poli-sci. And then I interacted with more folks outside of the straight-laced neoconservative Catholic school, especially in goth and metal scenes. And I watched Kevin Smith's Dogma way too many times. It's the best movie he's ever made. And I also did a lot more reading and research. And I came to view the Catholic Church in as much context as my young Canadian ass could possibly muster. It's a woefully outdated and flawed institution that especially in modern times has done so much inexcusable harm, especially wrapped up in a dogma of infallibility that seems rather paltry when you find thousands of bodies of dead indigenous kids underneath the residential schools in which that church ran. And yet along the way, I can't deny the power and resonance that faith can bring to people's lives, regardless of the source point, be it Christianity or Judaism or Islam or Buddhism or the almighty flying spaghetti monster. In an absurd world run by incomprehensible systems to the average person, clinging to that higher power might give them that frail stability they need to keep on going, especially if, for me, provided the progressive, forward-thinking historical context that I had growing up, and that is way too rare, and I dearly wish the Catholic Church actually tried to embrace. I also can't deny that reading the Gospels, the version of Jesus that was a mostly quiet spiritual hippie that occasionally ate and drank with prostitutes and sinners, and is shown to care for the poor, the sick, the disadvantaged more than anyone else, that's a version of kindness and aspirational altruism that the institutions of religion have never really matched, starting with the Acts of the Apostles and Paul's letters that laid the church's political foundations and 
They never need to be there. Well, look, my point is that I drifted away from the Catholic Church. I didn't have a violent exodus, which actually seems a lot more uncommon if you've grown up in an evangelical background, or let's say down in the United States for the past 40 years. And you can tell Lingu Agnota is framing a faith experience that is far closer to violence, albeit in a more layered way that spans dimensions physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. And the setting is essential to explaining all this frame. She moved to a town in rural Pennsylvania in recent years and draws many parallels to historical orders like the Cloisters of Ephrata, a isolated sect who based a lot of their devotion on fasting and celibacy in the 1700s. And I do think it's important to highlight what religion was in that era and setting. Keep in mind that the Puritan settlers of that land, they left England during the Reformation to come to an openly hostile environment with painfully limited resources and scarcity, where thoughts of the end of the world were never too far away, as common in times of great strife. See how the Book of Revelation was actually written? And while the Ephrata cloister wasn't especially Calvinist, it's hard not to see a certain brutality of that ideology slip into view. Some were destined by God to go to heaven, but original sin would ensure the majority never would. And you can never earn a place unless you were chosen from on high. It's an incredibly dour worldview, all based around the assumed damnation and the self-denial of the scrupulous conscience. But in trying to survive in that era and place, I get why people clung to it. And it's hard not to see the parallel to rural communities today racked with decay and opioid abuse and isolation in systems outside of their control. And when you intersperse that with very human suffering, where Lingua Ignota's personal framing comes closer, like the abuse implied on I Who Bend the Tall Grasses, or the terror of potentially being paralyzed on Repent Now, Confess Now, you get a taste of how visceral that devotion had to feel where hell and looming damnation is everywhere and while you hold your devotion there will be many around you who will not and the feminine subtext building off of Caligula is very necessary to bring into fo this into focus specifically in how sexual release clashes violently with those stripes of religion but also how women were held to standards of purity to then be mercilessly exploited within those systems, not just in the primeval violence of many hands, but also in the vocal snippets of disgraced J American televangelist Jimmy Swaggard, who actually got caught with prostitutes and then performed a public monologue of penance without ever actually saying what he did, and he still has an audience to this day. So the rapacious, violent appetites of man are allowed to be satiated and forgiven, to still receive their salvation. But if you are a woman who can remain ironclad in faith despite all of it, bathed in the blood of Christ that matches injuries inflicted upon you, feel like despite all of it, you have salvation, well, it kind of short circuits reason. You are blessed. You are saved. You can walk into church in the middle of a pandemic and remain safe. And it shows in a proud, individualized American society, a rather corruption of the homespun communal elements of the Afrata Cloister, paradise will be yours. The rest, they can just hang or burn. Oh, fucking Christ. No, literally, that's what I said aloud after fully sitting with some of these observations and this album. And while I appreciate that little heresy, let's unpack some of this. It goes without saying that Lingua Ignota is a singular force on this album to sell this turmoil, make it feel outright biblical. And as such, she did pivot away from the explosive noise and the harrowing distortion that came on Caligula. The hints of drone and synth they might be on the opening track provide a transition to get to this point, which makes somewhat sense for someone's seeking the balm of aesthetic chastity given the abuse described on that last album. But that's about the last of what we get in that territory, and that's a pretty significant change. This project is far less noisy and cacophonous and overwhelming and distorted shrieks, which only come through on a few songs at that and are all the more haunting in their absence. Instead, Lingua Ignota opts for something more spare and expansive, drawing on more neo-folk and medieval mass music to go along with some fractured samples that I previously described, which centers Lingua Ignota and her multi-tracked but kind of rough choral vocals surrounding her. And I actually really appreciate this choice. This was an album that really could have gone for more classically composed symphonic bombast, and in chunks it would absolutely fit, but instead she opted for a sound that was intentionally more ramshackle, 
fractured and real to reinforce that haunted rural vibe that draws the parallel from both centuries ago to well now it's not like apocalyptic messaging and calvinist subtext has left the modern evangelical movement and the rampant systemic hypocrisy hasn't exactly gone away either and you know the rational mind does not confront this sort of intensity well if they don't understand it what i appreciate that lingua ignota delivers across even some of the more tuneful moments here is that there are moments where real spiritual ecstasy can be found where you might even get why someone could be drawn into the magic but my god at what cost and that might be the most quietly unsettling part of all of this even amidst the guttural screams across i who bend the tall grasses or the utterly visceral imagery or the systemic abuse there will be those underfoot who will cling to devotion and even if they're in a rotten place with the heaps of dead around them they will not bend even in the face of a need to save someone beyond themselves and you know, it kind of goes without saying that it's, it's not really how I engage with my religion or my faith. Now, some of this is absolutely cultural. I've always been a city guy. Living in a small town sounds harrowing. And Canada doesn't really have much in the way of evangelicalism. Or even provinces like Quebec and recently Alberta that have more of a pronounced religious side. It's more political. It lacks that spiritual fervor. But I also don't have that bleak fundamentalist viewpoint of any god, let alone one with as much crushingly dark implications as much as we often see in certain parts of religion south of the border. It's not that I don't get the power of this imagery and this poetry. From a literary standpoint, or just being immersed in so much art was spun from it, I absolutely get it. I can understand that resonance. But it doesn't trigger that gut-level sense of dark reckoning I can imagine friends who grew up in more evangelical backgrounds will feel with this album or hell, just more American backgrounds. Don't get me wrong, I appreciate how viscerally beautiful and striking so many moments on this project are. The solemn organ and fragile bells providing implacable foundation for the grief and rage on I Who Bend the Tall Grasses. The strings and jagged guitar on the cusp of snapping on many hands. The plucky swells and ominous distorted crescendo on Man is Like a Spring Flower. Or even some of the more conventional melodies on Pennsylvania Furnace, Perpetual Flame of Centralia, or the solitary brethren of Ephrata. But I'll say this, some of the potency of this album is at a distance from me in comparison with Caligula. I think some of it comes with having that wild-eyed fundamentalism never as a serious presence in my life. And again, that's not saying I don't respect the emotionality, or that Lingua Nota can't create an atmosphere that makes it feel real, because she absolutely does. But like I said early on, something this extended and visceral and targeted might not always resonate on that gut level. And as a critic, it's kind of frustrating, especially with as much acclaim as piled up for this project, which kind of shows how many people have had similar experiences. But when I think about the layers of trauma this album peels through, I think I wound up with a blessing. But at the end of all this, how the hell do you grade a project like this? It's not one I can easily recommend, especially given how its subject matter could be literally triggering for a certain audience. And while this is less immediately terrifying than Caligula was, it's still a deeply unsettling listen that I'm not even sure provides the same level of catharsis at the end, especially with the bleakness of its implications. In other words, it's a much harder listen, and given very different circumstances, I'm not sure it's one that's going to pull me back in the same way even if I can absolutely appreciate and respect what it's doing. So no, for me it's not better than Caligula, for as much as anyone cares about that, but there's still so much texture, so much power, so much potency here. I gotta give this a light 8 out of 10. And again, it's not an album I can easily recommend, but in terms of looking for a very specific brand of religion, looking it in the face, and then holding its bloody annals aloft, I gotta say it's worth hearing. I just hope by the end that peace was found, whatever that might mean. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you'd like to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. Yeah, I had a lot to say on this one. I kind of was planning for this to be an On the Pulse and that to drop tomorrow. That might wind up delayed a day or two. It happens. But hey, if you guys actually want to check out the album, you should. And the comments are down there. Have fun. I can imagine it might get a little contentious. I said, I talked about religion. Of course it's going to get contentious. Beyond that, anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation, I'm all ears. And if you guys want to get involved in my scheduling process or add albums to my schedule, link to my Patreon right over there. Once again, don't feel obligated. It's tough times. I certainly appreciate that. But again, options available. But until then, I'm Mark. 
You're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.